observer, and he is also the general feature writer. He's interviewed many of the world's leading photographers, including William Everstein, Nan Golden, Robert Frank, and the Paul. He was named the interviewer of the year in the British, in the British Press, Press Awards in uh, 2003. He's uh, the winner of the 2011 J.W. Johnson. Johnson Award from the Royal uh, Photographic Society for major achievements in the field of photographic criticism for his writing in the Observer and the Guardian. And uh, I'd like to thank you for accepting this uh, um, uh, this uh, opportunity to talk about the criticism situation criticism in uh, in Great Britain. <coughs>
And uh, a lot of the books I want to talk about, including the three that I've chosen, they're quite personal to me. You know, they wouldn't be other people's choices. Or uh, I also have photo, photo books in my in my studio that if I wasn't writing my photography, I probably wouldn't have it. I probably would have sold or given to the university. Because uh, in my house, I only got things around me that I actually like. And it's become quite odd that I also have to have this other library, and a lot of it, much as I love a lot of you know, Thomas Truth and Mitch Epstein, I, you know, I don't really, they don't emotionally engage me with some other books do. So um, I've tried to keep this a little bit personal, which I hope you, you understand. It's not, it's not meant to be a definitive overview of the photo book. And um, I felt like I had to start with um, Ed Boucher because he's such a pivotal figure in where we are now. And the fact that 26 Glass Stations was published in 1963 and still remains a huge template for young artists um, who want to make work in the, in the similar vein. And the chef is an extraordinary character because um, he's an artist, but he made photo books. And he made photo books that were incredibly criticised at the time they came out. And he made them cheaply, and, uh, which I didn't realise until recently. I thought, you know, because you go online now, it's just like four or five thousand pounds. And it's really a zine, it's, it's, it's like a zine. And it's, he made it quickly, he made it cheaply, and he disseminated it. He left it in galleries all over America, thousands of copies. And I think it ran for $1.50 or $2 or something. And um, it was the antithesis of the big collectible of beautiful photography book. Uh, it was someone who wanted to get their ideas out into the world. And um, I think that he really does, he's an avatar for where we are now. Because a lot of the work that's sent to me, I'd say over 50% of the work that's sent to me, is in this spirit. It's young. It reminds me of, I'm old enough to remember punk, punk rock. You know? When I first came from, from Northern Ireland to London, I, I was blessed for, you know, to be 1976 and everything was good. And part of the whole punk thing was you can do it yourself. You, know, you can make these things yourself. You can make the group. You can make the fanzine. You can have the record company. You don't have to rely on the big corporations or the publishers. And I think there's a similar spirit in Britain with men on the ground. Um, and I think when you talk to, to self-publishers or young artists, this is one of the books that comes up time and time again. And um, you can see here how you know, it's, it's beautifully made, but it's not made to be, you know, to be collected, which it now is. Um, I'll come to collectors later on because I've got a bit of an issue with them as well. Um, this is some of those other books that we made. But they're really artist books. And it's an artist using photography, which is another thing that's very current today. Uh, and I talked about that again earlier, that there's been this shift away from people going out in the world with a camera, which is what defined photography for most of its history, to people making photographic work, often that isn't their own pictures, and um, often on the web phone. <laughs> uh, and it's, that's a word, this is very canary, which kind of suits me. Well, um, this is the other um, great book in action for this one, Every Building on the Sunset Strip, which is um, the first one he, he, he drove to Oklahoma City and just photographed every gas station, and this one he did every building. And he stood on the corner and photographed them from the same point of view, the same way Stephen Shaw would do later on Broadway. And I think that alongside, um, this is something else, alongside the Japanese, provoke photographers of the 60s. Richet is one of the key templates for young artists today who are making photographic work. Uh, this is a picture of him with, with one of his books. And um, cheap, do it yourself and get it out there. And uh, make it as best you can on a limited budget. Um, it still becomes collectible, of course, as time goes by, which is another interesting thing that happens with these. They're not throwaway books, but they're not made with the same beauty that we would imagine we'd talk about. And it, we, it may be a good thing to talk about. I mean, I think there's a distinction between the photo book and the photography book. <coughs> uh, I've had arguments with Martin Parr about this, but you know, but a lot of things that, you know, something like The Americans is, is, a, is a photography book, or, you know, William Anderson's guy. And I think something like this is a photo book. It's semantics, most important. Um, the other 
touchstone is provoke the uh, Japanese movement in the 60s. Um, they made, I think, three magazines in total, which is not very many, but it's, it has su had such a lasting influence. Again, it's someone producing magazines. It's born out of impatience with the mainstream. Um, these guys were punks, so they didn't want to wait around for publishing houses to catch up with them. They, they would get you know, derelict houses and have shows where they just pasted the photographs on the wall and made this magazine to disseminate their ideas. And um, this, is the, this is the three issues of the magazine. Again, you know, if you go on, eight books should be astonished at how much it costs. At the time, they were mass produced, and a lot of them, uh, according to David Moriarty, a lot of them were given away. And um, Moriarty, of course, he's, a, he's an incredible character in all this, because uh, he's, you know, in the 70s now, he's still making this kind of work, he's still making these kind of books. And um, I suppose alongside Ed Michelet, he's the sort of other person that people talk about. He had a huge show a couple of years ago, Tate Modern, alongside uh, William Clem. <coughs> and I thought it was really interesting because the show, I found the show quite underwhelming when the work was on the wall, but when you went into the back room and saw the books, his work just came alive. And I think he was one of the first photographers to realise the pure power of the book as an object in itself. Um, I, apparently he didn't ever think he would be shown in galleries, and so he just made a book and that was the thing. And I think that's where we are today as well. A lot of people are doing the same. Um, this is one of his um, great books. Uh, again, I mean, it's mind boggling what these books might cost. And Moriano was influenced by um, by Klein, by Klein's New York book. Um, Klein's always talk about that, but I never really, I think, got him the way I have done in the last few years. And it's interesting because I, I'm in the middle of compiling this thing to the Guardian where I've asked a hundred photographers what their favourite photo book is. And Martin Parr chose this, which surprised me. Um, and he said that this you know, changed the language of the photo book. It changed the whole idea of what you could do with the photo book. And, uh, uh, it's, it's given me a sort of newfound sort of understanding of Klein's work. Uh, he's such a sort of acerbic person. <laughs> I think when I interviewed him, it kind of put me off. Uh, he, was, he wasn't a very nice person, so that. And um, <laughs> it kind of does affect how you react to his work. Uh, the ego, you know, the ego is quite strong. I mean, I call him William Klein, he is the greatest photographer that ever walked the earth. And, um, he, did, he asked me, he said to me, what do you think people are going to make of the show Tate Modern with me and this Japanese guy? I said, well, I think it's going to be great. Going to... Nah. And he goes, why not? He goes, well, they're all going to be asking, who the fuck is Tate Mariana? I thought, okay, <laughs> this is what I'm dealing with. And so it kind of put me off. And, and it was a great show because it showed the sort of, you know, Mariana worships him. But, it, it, but the feeling wasn't mutual. But he's an extraordinary, extraordinary man and, and a great book maker. Um, this is a book, I just wanted to put this in because it's one of my favourite books. And it's, uh, when I did the Guardian thing where they chose Alex Toth, the American photographer, chose this as well, which is great. And he's kind of the Martin Power of America uh, in terms of his influence and how he works. And it was just to show that, you know, there were beautiful photo books made as well. It wasn't just Mariana and Provoke and guys doing it really cheap, but people were making in the 60s, very, very good. This is an amazing book. He made it after his wife had died. And um, it's sort of full of grief and sort of solitude. I think the raven has a, a particular place in Japanese mythology about death and stuff. But it's just a republication. You can find it again. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I don't want to suggest that it's all this punk energy and everything's mad. And, you know, so there's also beauty in the beautiful books being made as well. Um, what it from. It's pretty relentless, but it works. Uh, and I like the fact that it doesn't explain anything. But you can kind of tell it's about death and mourning. Um, this is another character that I think is very important in the last 20 years. Uh, you know Stephen Gill, is he, is he quite well known? Mm -hmm. And Stephen was the first guy that I still came across who was, I thought, who was really a bookmaker. And that's really where his energy is right. 
he wasn't that interested in putting on a show or having a gallery. He, what he was interested in was making a beautiful book. And for years he went his own way and with a little cheap camera. He famously photographed the flea markets in London and Hackney. And before Hackney became a studio, he was wandering around doing books like this. And um, making, you see the colours very beautiful. And he just had a, I remember when I first met him, he, you know, I was still sort of grappling with the idea of the photo book versus the print and stuff. And he kind of was one of the people that convinced me that if you approach the book the way an artist would approach the book as a photographer, you can make a very beautiful thing. And I think he's sort of, he's, sort of, he's underrated in a, in a way, but I just put this in, we were talking earlier about the pencil. For some reason, it reminded the two, they reminded of each other, I don't know why. It's just sort of ornate colours. This is the first ever, am I right, this is the first ever photo book? So they say. Yeah. It's certainly the first British one. And um, the pencil of nature, which is great. He, apparently, was a, he, he slipped something inside where he had to convince people that it was actually photographs, not etchings and drawings, because people wouldn't believe that it was made mechanically. Everyone thought it was an actual engraving. Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing new under the sun. I just put this in the ground and it. And it's a Stephen again. And you see, these are. This is a pastiche of another book. There was a series of books in the 60s called Fiend Studies, which were about flora and fauna and topology. And he basically went around Hackney and he photographed behind billboards, the backs of billboards. Um, and it's a conceptual idea. This is the other thing that's interesting, which I'm going to go a bit deeper later. Um, with a lot of these new books, the idea is the thing rather than a bunch of beautiful photographs. It's the idea is foregrounded. Like, you know, conceptualism, another one was very great. I love this cover because you know what you're getting. And he saw that it was sealed, so you couldn't actually see it. And he actually instructed the Photoshop not to open it. So, it was a conceptualism. Um, this is one that he made, uh, he buried it in his garden for a month and then dug them all up and stuff. Because, I don't know. It gets a bit silly sometimes. If you go to one scene in a couple of weeks, there's an English artist called Belinda Gibson. And she, um, her studio burnt down and she, she lost all her books and prints. But she's doing a performance of Unseen where she's got smoke houses and she's got smoke photography books, which you can then buy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what you do with them. I mean, you can't take them home because they stick. <laughs> but this, this is kind of the same idea. Um, and you, you can see a lot of the tropes of conceptual art creeping into photography. And as I said, photography moving from photography to the photographic. And I think that's one of the big things that's going on in that, which we can discuss later at this time. This is his last book, and again, six different covers, marble, handmade. For me, the photographs inside didn't quite live up to the covers, but it's, it's a beautiful, they're beautiful things. Um, and if you go to, um, you were saying about there's no books in libraries, but I know some of the art colleges that not all of the photography colleges now build up quite a big library. And someone was saying that this is one of the books that the students really go for and sort of look at and study and want to sort of emulate. Um, the other thing that's happened is there's alongside the staff publishing, there's been a proliferation of small publishing houses have arrived in uh, London quite late. Um, we tend to do things quite late in England, but then really go for it. This is, if you think this is like 60 years after Ray Boucher, but Udi is a, is a French guy uh, who, who lives in Hackney. And I'd love to know how he makes, I'm, I'm quite baffled at the economy of photo books and how they make any money. Because this guy puts out, you know, editions of about 500. And he puts out all of Vivian Sasson's books, for instance. And makes them very beautifully. And um, he, what he used to do was, the price would go up, you know, with, when the first hundred sold, the second hundred the price would go up to so the last ones became quite expensive. Um, well, he makes very good books, and Vivian has now become quite big. Vivian Sasson, Dutch photographer, in the fashion world and in the conception world, but she still makes books with this, you know, and, and literally he has an office half the size of you, and a couple of interns, and you know, he's making his books. Um, there's a really good story to be written about the, the economy of photography books and how much they cost to produce, particularly when. A lot of major publishing houses, I don't know if it's the case in Sweden, but in Britain, you know, they're now asking photographers for money. 
quite a lot of money. I did an essay for a book last year for a photographer called Antonio Almas. And it was published by Darry Lewis, and he, he had about 12,000 pounds towards the cost of his own photography. Mm -hmm. And when he told me this, I was just like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Tommy, Tommy just said the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's a lot of money yeah. if you're starting off. And, um, which you don't get back mm -hmm. when you first put it. And I was saying, well, why don't you start, you know, you can start publishing, but if someone's worked out, you can start publishing a quite beautiful book for 8,000 pounds. And I thought we'd come to self publishing later. These are some of Udi's books. Um, this is the Peter Hugo book, um, very scary book where he reversed all the skin pigments in the cameras. So he's South Africa, three years of white people, like sort of like albinos and black people. So. And um, this is what it's called. And it's, it's quite interesting that um, books like this are being published from very small little studios all over London. At very high quality, and um, I think they're quite high price as well. I mean, Forty-five pounds is quite a lot of money. Isn't it? That's the one thing I get in, when I write my column, more than anything else, is people posting about the cost of photography. It's the one thing all the time. People think they're too expensive. Uh, he also puts out a series of pamphlets, uh, Damien from Udi, who puts these in. So. He said to me, if there's a photographer I see, and I'm not quite sure, I mean, I think this could go somewhere, or it may not, I'd pull out a pamphlet, just because it's, it's a good for the development to have something out, but they don't really warrant, they're too young, and they're too inexperienced to warrant anything, but I think it's quite interesting about working. And these sell out very quickly as well. So they're a, they're a cross between a zine and, and a full book photography book, and quite cheap. Um, Morel books, do, do you know about Aaron Morel? He's quite a character in London and for all sorts of reasons. He lives the life. And Aaron's another one. I've sat down with him and I said, oh, how do you make a living? And he's, he's, he's constantly struggling and he's quite a wayward character. I went to his stall at Arl this year. I went three times to his book stall. And the three times I went, there was no one in the book stall. And the place was packed with people. And you know, some people were leaving money, some people were taking the books. And I don't remember how he was in the wine bar and I'm like, Aaron, you know, but he, he hasn't even got an intern on the stall. But he, he seems to get people, like he's got Boris McCallum, he did a book with Paddy Smith. I don't know how he does, he's quite an extraordinary character. And um, he, he, he produces very high-end photography, but it's not very many. And I think he's sort of a maverick. And the fact that people like him exist in this sort of age, of Boris, this sort of highly capitalist age of ours, um, I can't I can't remember the guy who doesn't even isn't even there in his own stall. I think it's, it's kind of an anti-capitalist statement in a way. Though he's a loser. Um, and then you've got Mac, which is a step up. Mac's probably the most important publisher of photo books in Britain mm -hmm. and has the most high profile. Mac and Mac worked for Spagel and then he split with them and he's done his own um, thing. It's a very interesting catalog. They're, they're, they're starting to look like there's a Mac. Style, I like a style to style. There's a kind of in-house style of it. But he would be, it's very good man, but he would be um, a very successful, I mean, I wouldn't put him in the obvious, he, he does very, very well. The photographers want to make work with him. And um, here we have one of your father comes in. Great book. And um, it's very hard to, for, to talk to these guys about how they decide who they publish and who they don't. I'm trying to do a few sort of articles about you know, what, what's, what are the choices, what governs your choices. And um, I think this is one of the big challenges, actually, more than one. Do you know about this book? It's where they went into a press archive in Belfast of all the troubles. And each photograph had a sticker on it if it had been used in the paper, and a different sticker if it had been used more than once. So they basically pulled off the sticker and then magnified what was underneath. So this is what you're seeing. Uh, Broomberg and Channel are quite a big thing in uh, England. They're quite they're, they're cutting edge. They just won the Deutsche Post Prize last year. The war crime. And um, they don't really take photographs anymore. They use fine images um, for better or worse. Um, this is war crime or two. It's just the fine images were from um, the Archive of Modern Conflict, which is a big archive in London. 
very mysterious guy who runs it and he sort of collects old press archives, albums. <coughs> I don't know, he's got a huge amount of paper throughout the world collecting strange photographs. And there was a point last year where there was about six French photographers in there working. Christina was in there, Christina and Bell, Adam and Ollie were in there, Stephen Gill was in there, all making work from fine linen. Huge, huge thing at the moment, fine photography, what you do with it. So this is what I'm saying, this notion that you went out in the world with your camera, it's not really where it's at anymore. It's kind of, you can make photographs of anything, anything on the internet. This is one of the, <coughs> they used Bertolt Brecht's original text for his war camera and then they used photographs of men and stuff like that. Um, very handmade sort of zine kind of book, but sold out immediately. Highly collectible. And then um, it led to this, which you probably know, which is the yeah, version of the whole battle. Um, I don't know what to make myself, but interesting book. Well, they just pasted in, well, they didn't paste in there, a huge army of interns pasted in photographs from the Arcade of Modern Fun Country. It didn't really cause a big, I think they wanted to cause a big sting, you know, and offend people. Even in America, it didn't really. I mean, if you really want to cause a stick, you would do this with the Quran, but we're not going to do that in this case. Um, so it's, I think it's a bit of a bother. But um, they're interesting artists. And they sort of illustrate the idea that you can now sit in, at home and troll the internet and make a photographic book without ever clicking the show. Um, the ramifications of that, of course, we could talk all day about that. Um, and I think there's still a place for people who go out in the world with their camera. Um, Paul Graham wrote an amazing essay about four or five years ago. It's on American suburb X, um, Don't Record site, which is a really amazing repository of writing about the film. Um, and he wrote an essay, it's called The Inscrutable Apple and Big Apple. Or something. But it's all about this hierarchy uh, in galleries between people who take photographs and people who don't. And he's saying there's still a big place for people who go out and take photographs. But Curators now are more drawn towards conceptual work. And it's interesting because I would call him a kind of conceptual photographer now, so it's interesting that he's arguing for still going out and taking photographs. This is the end Holy Bible. Oh, the own Holy Bible, is it? Um, this self publish, be happy, is um, something I think that every city should have. I've talked to Bruno Seychelles, who's getting started, and I've said that you really should. Franchise this out, you know, to Oslo, to Paris, to, and have sort of many versions of this, local versions of this, because the local is quite interesting. We actually have it here. Yeah, well, yeah, you should. I was thinking you should actually sort of give it away a little bit, and let people, because he wants to, you know, he's, it's making a mill now because he's. And I went round to his office last week, and he couldn't get through the door with the amount of stuff that he gets sent. I mean, he gets, he's doing one book a day as well, and it's not enough. And um, this is, to me, is, it's important that you have something like this for people who self-publish, because it's the hub where the work gets shown. And it, when Bruno started out, it was, that's all it was. It was, you'd send me your work and I would put it up on my site. And I'd get those followers and I would see it. And then they can order the book from you. And uh, this, you know, so this, so it gets like 200 of these every day. Um, and it's grown and grown and it's become quite an interesting phenomenon, I think, um, it's one of the stalls. Over the period that I've been writing about it, it's gone from being a hub to somebody that started publishing little editions to now being a publisher. And it's, you know, it, it, it's the sort of stuff that was sent in. A lot of the zines again. There's, the one thing I would say is that there's not a lot of quality control if you do something like this because you know, you're basically, your intention is to show whatever anyone sends you. So there's no one really being rigorous about the work that goes in there. And you've got to read through a lot of stuff to see stuff. This is their, the kind of stuff they do. And they do a lot of um, workshops, they do a lot of um, lectures, they do something called the Fulbrook Orchard, which will be on the scene, which isn't anything that you think it's going to be. It's actually about him. Um, <coughs> the office. And this kind of 
It's born out of the same impatience that I was talking about earlier, that Roche and Provoke and Mariana had. You know, we can't wait any longer for Stadel and stuff to catch up with us. We, we're just going to do it ourselves. We can't, you know, it's basically, it's the punk attitude of the mainstream's over there and we don't, we don't even care about it anymore. They don't care about us, so we don't care about them. And um, this is one of the pamphlets they put out um, various, with various photographers. They do weekends, almost like little mini festivals. And often they will, I don't know what he did when he came here, but often they will produce a book. Just gave a lecture. Well, the, the last one we did in Japan, we actually, it was a half day. And at the end of it, they chose to be well, reduced to work by 6 o'clock and then sold the 100 copies. It's interesting. They do a school. I don't actually don't do a school anymore, but they tried it for a while. <laughs> um, and it's just an interesting, they're just an interesting hub <laughs> for ideas. So um, I don't know if this is the same kind of statements. I think not. But uh, every day they do a book, book de jour, and it's quite pretentious bringing a book de jour. Is that French? <laughs> uh, and uh, these are some of the books that they've got there. Um, it's one of you. Oh. I did that before I knew you were going to be on. I'm not going to say that. There's no one. I love your titles. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you mean you, you could probably, I mean, was it helpful for you to be on here? Um, I don't know, they had a shop for a short while also. Yeah. I think I saw a few copies, not a lot. No, no, maybe 10 or something. Well, there you go. Maybe it's not screwed, I think. They also have self published in Norway, which um, is exactly what it says on the label. There's loads of guys photographing their girlfriends <laughs> with no clothes on. Usually with radiators in the back. That's the only book that we sold out. <laughs> 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 that might sell a lot, but um, <laughs> your country. And um, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's. I I always go on just to look at the titles. Because sometimes you know, this is one of my favourite titles of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, the book doesn't really live up to the title, but um, that sold out pretty quickly. I'm not quite sure we follow. Um, and there's a mischief to it, isn't there? There's kind of energy and a mischief, and I think this is what's really all about it. And whether or not that energy gets transformed into really brilliant photo books, it's hard to say. Um, this is Alex Soth in his office. Alex Soth, Alex Soth, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, but um, he's an interesting character in American photo book culture because he sort of straddles so many. There he is. He makes very beautiful books. I mean, his first book was seen about Mississippi and um, you know, Tree. They look like, you know, it's a classic style of type book of documentary. And then he took all these swerves and um, started making little zine type things and having stuff out, like House of Coats, under, under a different name. <coughs> and pulling out a lot of products, almost like an independent music label. He suddenly started pulling out all the stuff really cheaply. And then he so often to do a really beautiful book. And I think he's had a very, very capitalistic effect in America, where there isn't doing you know, something so big. And New York probably has a photo book culture in every day, but somewhere in the middle, he's operating. Like the cross between Bruno and Martin Parr, he's got that sort of kind of. He's a catalyst for a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, these are all things he just puts out. This is like a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to jump into, this has happened in the last 10 years, self-published me happy. Mm -hmm. Bruno suddenly realised that he was missing out on something. I think when the Afronauts took off, because the first time most people saw that book was on his site. And he started thinking, well, hang on a minute, what, why, how can we make our own? And I said, well, I said, well, the obvious thing to do is publish your own books. And they started with these limited editions. They did a Brimberg and Chandler book and they did a Christina from the Dead book. 200 copies with the print. And then he, he bumped into Lorenzo Pateri, and I've chosen this as one of my best photo books of the last 10 years. This has kind of become a phenomenon in this book. Lorenzo is an Italian guy who lives in London. He's from, he's from Venice, or is it? And he, he, trained, he trained at Fabrica, um, the Benetton sort of school for photography and design, where Greenberg Charman also went. 
But more importantly to me, he worked for a long time as a set builder and a set painter for Tinto Brass, who was a sort of soft palm film director in, in Italy. If you go on, on YouTube, you can read really terrible films. The, the films with shaky furniture, you know, the plumber comes to the door, all that kind of stuff. And, well, he had made all the sets. And I think that this is what really informs this book, the fact that he's a sculptor and an artist. So he went to Ridley Road Market in, in East London, which is one of the last streets in Hackney that is held out against the hipster revolution. You know, it's the hipster tidal wave. It's, it's like Brooklyn, it's swept all the floor of the Hackney. I mean, it's, it's on the, and I was in college, I used to get a squat there, and I went down the street the other day, and I was like, what happened? You know, it's unbelievable. Coffee bars and cappuccino bars and art galleries. And guys with beards. Uh, everywhere you look. And uh, th this mad street market managed to hold out. And it's, it, it sells African and Jamaican food and Chinese food. So everything in the book is taken from the market. So the porpoise is from the market. The, veg, the weird vegetables, sculptures are all from the market. The pigments you find on the, on the pigment, this guy who sells pigments, that people eat, chocolate people eat, to make them horny, apparently. African people have certain chocolate. And uh, so he bought, he bought all these things and he sort of went to town and made this extraordinary book, which kind of, you know, it's conceptual and it's weird, but it kind of captures the story of the place. And it's gone, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's, it's sold out so quickly. And he had a show at the time, which gallery in the back of this. He's, um, the other thing I've got to say about Lorenzo is he's such a beautiful guy that it's really nice sometimes when that happens. When you meet someone and they're actually quite humble and, and then it happens for them. Because normally a lot of photographers aren't like that, <laughs> in my experience. Um, I know there's quite a few here, but you know, the ego and the obsession. And uh, that's all about me and my work for the next three hours, what happens there. Uh, and this is one of the, I think this is one of the first editions. It, it's come out in seven different editions, but it's a very important book, I think. Um, made with African fabric, but Bruno's mother sold one of the books and stuff. And the first hundred were given away and died, that was Bruno's mom made. But Bruno's mom really should be doing talks. <laughs> <laughs> She's the hidden power behind South Coast we have. And, um, yeah, beautiful thing. Yeah, I think there's still some copies on it. Um, this is the aftermaths, of course. Um, is it, has it had an impact here? This book, people know about it? Because in England, this was like me from normal. I mean, this was just like. Uh, when I went to Ireland in 2011, I was always at this, but it was a rumour. You know, Martin Carr and uh, Marcus Shad, we're going to see this amazing film in this book, The Aftermaths. This one of his made up, created this story about um, the Zambian space program. Zambia had a space program in the 60s. After uh, the Americans went to the moon, uh, the president of Zambia decided that he was going to put a woman on Mars. This is a true story. And of course, they had no money for it, but they, they chose a woman and they trained people and tried to build the spacecraft. And she found this story of the Zambian space program when she was trolling the internet. Uh, uh, it was among the, the 10 craziest ideas in history that she found this. So she, she recreated it uh, in Spain where she lives. Um, and got these local um, uh, black people who worked in the, I think it was a local African restaurant or something, come and be in the aftermath. It's caused a bit of trouble, there's been a bit of trouble she about whether or not it's mildly racist. But I think it's gone with such love and sort of affection that I'm not quite sure it is. But it just took off this book, and she published 1500 copies, and she gave, she sent one to me, and she sent one, she sent, it depends who you believe. She says that Martin bought five. Jerry Badger told me Martin bought 25. <laughs> Someone else told me Martin bought 35. Um, and it suddenly got, it just got this word of mouth thing, and the book just became this extraordinary And before even the issues, the editions were sold out, it was changing hands on the internet for huge amounts of money. And it became this sort of, it became the book that defined self publishing and what you could do. And the fact that she had given up her job as a photojournalist in Spain. Uh, worked for seven years and spent all her savings, 12,000 euros, to make this book um, with a couple of designer friends she knew who worked for colours. And she, she basically sank everything she had into this book. And it's a fairy story. Uh, it now, I looked last night just while I was doing this, I looked online and it's, uh, it's £15,000 for the edition without the print. 
which is quite phenomenal for a book that's two or three years old. The other thing that's phenomenal about it is that you, when you do talks like this, you realise that nobody has seen the bloody book. I mean, no one's seen I mean, this book is a legend, but no one's actually seen the thing. Because there's so few of them. It's attained a life of its own. And um, she is sort of like, she's finally stopped um, talking about it and giving lectures about it. I, I, I emailed her last night to see what she was doing because I said I was going to talk about it. And she's now starting to start publishing. Perhaps she, she, she's bringing out her first someone else's book that she's bringing out. And the girl who helped design this has just brought out a very beautiful book about bulimia and eating disorders. I can't her name's just gone from my head. Uh, I wrote about it about two weeks ago. Very interesting book. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Wasn't it Layla or something? Yeah. I've read some full of this, I can't. It'll come to me. But it's worth checking out. Uh, it's, it'll be a, book, a book about eating disorders, something that can make you rush to the shop. It is a very interesting book. Um, this is where I, I just want to get personal for a minute because um, on my own sort of journey, leaving that next week, I just love this book so much. I mean, I just, it's, to me, it's one of the defining photo books of the last you know, 30, 40 years. It would have been in the year, I've been the last 20 years. And it was, it was, I was writing a lot about music. I started off writing about music, you know, for music groups and stuff, and then for the Guardian before I did photography. And um, I remember getting this book. Someone gave it to me for my birthday. I, I, I thought the guy, a music photographer, and he said, You know, have a look at this. And I was just, I couldn't believe, I, I couldn't believe that you could make a photo book about stuff like this. Um, and it's, it's his family. It's basically his mum and dad. His dad's an alcoholic, and his mum uh, likes food. And, <laughs> and she likes to <laughs> jigsaw food. And she seems to have made it a dress. I don't know what's going on. It was, it was such, it was kind of a shock to me, as well as a beautiful, it was, it was, it, it reminded me of the punk records I bought, where you'd, where you'd get them home. I remember buying a, a record by the pop group from Bristol, it was, and you get it home, you didn't even know if you liked it or not, you were going like, it's so confusing, you're brilliant. It could be, you know, I, I might never listen to it again, or it could be brilliant. But I felt the same thing with this, and the fact that he was making, uh, you know, well actually, what he actually did, what Richard actually did, was he was studying to be a painter. And he made these photographs on a cheap camera in order to make paintings from them. And his, his tutor happened to see them. And his tutor just goes, forget about the painting, man, you only just put this book out. And he took it to the side of the put it out. And it still really seems like it's such an extraordinary thing that you could point your camera and, and be so distinctively brilliant at the top of it, and you get this sort of stuff. <coughs> I mean, the decor helps in the fact that they've got off their faces all the So this is kind of enough love. And then this is sort of like not love. And um, this is his dad and, and um, his mum with great tattoos. Just before she punched him apparently, I saw him give a lecture recently. Um, and I, before I forget, this has just been republished by a rattle book so you can get it again. It's, but they've messed up the cover, they've done a different cover. But it's, I mean, I, trust me, it's one of the great covers. Um, I mean, it's genius. It's genius. Um, and, and there's a tenderness to it. I don't think I mean, there's a lot of debate about voyeurism and privacy and stuff, but I think, you know, this is his family, this is what he was involved in. And he took photographs of it. And you couldn't really, I mean, imagine trying to make paintings of this. I wouldn't really, really have this kind of energy. Or, or to try and make a novel or something like that. This is my favourite photograph from the, <laughs> from the whole end. But, uh, when you show this photograph in, in colleges in England, people get very upset because they're kept. If it was a child, it wouldn't be short. <laughs> it wouldn't be really anything to do with animals. And, um, and have, you, have you ever read, have you ever met William? No. Uh, he's an interesting character because he is, he is what you would imagine. He gives these great talks where he can't really, he can't really explain anything. It's brilliant, it's quite refreshing. There's no conceptualism in the literature, which is, tries to explain what he's trying to do. Um, this is another book I think that's. Uh, this is very important to me, this book, because um, I just think it's, you know, I think it was 1957. Just, can that be right? Mm. I used to think it was the 60s, but apparently it was the 50s. And Van der was an extraordinary character. But this was kind of one of the first stage photographers, I guess. See, so this is a real person, Bobby Madden. She's a very famous so model, um, dancer, singer. She was a big um, 
influence of Patti Smith. In fact, she gave Patti Smith the tattoo that's on her knee. Um, Patti Smith made this pilgrimage to Paris to meet her after seeing this book way back in the 70s. And he basically found her and then he sort of trailed her around for a few days doing reportage. And then he thought this doesn't work. So he then directed her to go and do what she normally does. But he kind of directed and stage managed the photographs. So it is kind of photojournalism, but it's also staged. And they are real people, and she is in real situations. But <coughs> Amber Exxon is really sort of composing the photos and telling them what to do. Which is quite extraordinary when you think it's 1957. And um, it's all around the left bank in Paris when the, the um, situationists were. There were these philosophy guys who sort of were behind the 1968 riots. Um, and some of them are in this book, quite famous. I think Guy Debord, the philosopher, is in the book somewhere, like I said. And um, I just think it's an amazingly prescient book that this guy sort of directed and engineered and sort of conceptualized what would have been reportage and made it all of a sudden. I had this extraordinary moment with it. Um, I think, she, I think she died a few years ago. I did a piece about it and someone got in touch and said she died. Um, she ended up completely covered tattoos, her face, everything. Quite a extraordinary one. This is um, a friend, uh, Mark Baldwin's book, um, Ocean. I just think, I, I had to choose this because um, it's very different from all the other books. Like, um, because of the simplicity of them. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the beautiful simplicity of one great idea. And the great idea was to find these guys in India who had never been to the sea. They were from a landlocked part of India. And basically he accompanies them as they go to the ocean for the first time. And I think it's, it's almost perfect, this book. There's not, it's very small, it's, it's sitting over in the middle. There's not one extraneous photograph in it, there's, there's one little paragraph of text. And it's black and white and really simple. And I just think it's, I'm always saying to students, you know, you've got, you've got to have a great idea. You've got to execute it brilliantly, and the end result is going to be brilliant. All those three things, if one of them falls down, that's, this is the problem with exceptionalism. You've got to carry it right through. And I think this is a classic example of, of, of just a brilliant idea I've done. And he edited this time from hundreds and hundreds of photographs. Um, I, just, I, mean, I really love it. And, uh, uh, this photograph of one, I think, is almost worth kind of different. Just that joy of these guys being out there. Um, this is pretend to actually lie, but and I had a long think about including this because it's a very controversial and dark, strange book. <coughs> and I think he's, a, a, he's an amazing artist, even though I've met him since. Um, he's like William Agustin's bastard son. He's a sort of southern gentleman. So I was expecting this one to get fuck up. And this guy turns up with a cravat, you know, on the suit, and he's really, really beautiful, beautifully spoken southern guy. But he made a book about his mum having sex. Which, whatever way you look at it, is a little bit strange. Um, this is his mom, and uh, he said he says in the book, my mom's a narcissist, an exhibitionist, and uh, a controller. And uh, when I wrote about this book, he says I bought it in New York, um, and I took it home. And I thought, Jesus, this is wild. This is wild. I mean, this is such a. It's, it's very hard to be shocked nowadays by anything in, in my photo book. But I thought this. And the subject matter was so transgressive, and the way he had done it was so interesting. I'm sure I'm not showing the sort of horrors I thought that's And obviously, his mother's quite troubled, and he, I don't know if he's troubled or not, but it takes a certain amount of courage to photograph your mom having sex with some of your friends. Um, and in, in the book, he includes his diaries. His thoughts and um, some of his mom's interviews that he's done with his mom. And, she's, and he realized that this is all about performance, that his mom was actually performing for his camera. And not only performing for the camera, but directing the whole tone of the book. There's a real huge performing aspect. And, um, but as lots of people pointed out when I wrote about it, it's still a guy photographing his mom having sex. Whatever way you cover it up, it's still a pretty mild thing to do. And um, she, got, she got in touch with me back at him. And she said, you know, I, you know I'm really pissed off at this book because my name should be on alongside Lee's, because, you know, it's a collaboration. 
And that really made me think about it differently. That she was actually thinking, no, I'm an artist as well making this. And it wouldn't be made without me. Uh, it ends up quite sad because she's obviously, um, she's, she's one who's very, has a lot of trouble getting over her. It's really a book about mortality. And um, as most, you know, there's a lot of people so one way or the other. Um, and I still, I did an interview with a couple of years ago. We had a show in London. It was a show about motherhood. Uh, Susan Beck, the American curator, curator of the show about motherhood. And she rang me up and said, I'm thinking of putting Lee's book, or Ranger Cruz, I'm thinking of putting Lee's work in the show. And I was going, like, you know, are you mad? You know, it's, it, that would be just a time, because the tabloids would get a hold of it. And, um, kind of didn't happen, but people were annoyed. A lot of women were annoyed by the work. And the same when it was shown in Ireland a few years ago. Um, they did this up, they did this strange thing where you walk through the show and then at the end they had the text. And the text said, well, this is his mum. And what I thought was kind of slightly immoral, you know, that you should have, they should have let people know before they went in. And a lot of, a lot of you know, feminists were, were understandably annoyed at the whole thing. But I think it's a very important book, it's an interesting book, and it has a life of its own. And it's a book. I've never enjoyed the work in the gallery. I've seen it in art, I've seen it at the photographer's gallery. It just isn't as powerful. It just, and that's one of the reasons why I chose it, because it's very much a work that suits the medium that it was made in. And the medium is the book. And, um, you know, a book is a journey. It was great to see that film, even though it was like Kale. You know, because a book is a journey, isn't it? You, mean you journey into it. It's a different journey than going into a gallery, I think. Um, uh, and this is a, a big crew talk, but I was just thinking, I've got to put it in because it's, you can do anything with the, with, the, with the photo book. You know, look, she's a Dutch artist and she sort of produces a lot of work. And this is basically, she just photographed herself every day after she'd worked out on the treadmill. And she used to just put these, uh, these uh, daily exhaustion sculptures, she used to put piles of them in the gallery and think she should show and you could take it away. So she made it cheaply and gave it away. Basically, her over, I think, six weeks or something, just exercise. And I can't say, I mean, the idea is predominant here, isn't it? It's like, it's not really about how beautiful the work is or how brilliant the work is. And a lot of people might have problems with that, and I think sometimes I do as well, because it's not really about, I mean, it's not Claudia Bresson or even Robert Frank. It's not about that anymore. Uh, and I know a lot of photographers find that difficult, but. The photo book, if I had one criticism of it, and this is a particular photo book, is that it's, it's incredibly promiscuous medium. And there's a lot of stuff out there that probably will be forgotten and hasn't been edited very well. And um, I'm not saying this is that, but I mean, you could see that it could fall into that category quite easily. Uh, and the fact that the way she's designed the book, you could flip over different parts and different things. Um, I think you can do anything you want. With the photography book right now, for the first time ever, it can be about anything. It can even be not about. Someone showed me a book that's been white, that was just white light. It's like page of white. And it, 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 he told me the extraordinarily difficult process he'd gone through to get these white. And I was <laughs> because process, I'm going to leave it to the process. I, 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 we could do a whole lot of talk on process. You know, I feel like it's taken over. And you know, the end result of that doesn't really matter anymore. It's the process. It's and um, I want to make a book with Bruno called Protest, Not Process. Because <laughs> he's, he's a master of process. And I just thought, you know, this is what, I mean, this stood as a, as a great, a great photo book for years. This is one of the great. Still is. She's one of my heroes. And, I, and there are still photo books being made like this, you know, with the care and the attention and the craft and, you know, the sense of moment and all those things. But we're more likely to come across a photo book, I guess, which is Billy Rickard's photographs pulled off um, Google Street View. So he draws through Google Street View and says, This is a resource. I can edit and curate Google Street View, and I can tell you, I can make a photo book about America and its urban poor without actually going out into those communities the way that Eugene Smith or someone would have out and spent. There is a moment you can actually now sit with your laptop and you see an anonymous. And there's been quite a few people, you Mr. Henry mentioned earlier, he's done a, he did a whole series where he um, went through 
Google Street View. You went on the, the sex set with lorry drivers, swapped information about where the best prostitutes were in Europe. And then he found out through Google Earth the places where the women actually were, and then he isolated the photographs and made a show in a book <coughs> all about that. It's not photography as we know it, and it's not even the photograph as we know it, but it's where we live now. And this, of course, is the most iconic photo book of the most iconic in my own photo book, first published in France, 1957, I think. Robert Frank's great book. And this is Mishka Hennett's version of it, which is less American, so really, to all the people out of the photographs and photoshop. Kind of cheap, but kind of funny. And, you know, because it's, because it's, the, it's like a bully bag, it's kind of iconic. It's the iconic book to do this with. Does it mean anything more than the moment it was produced? I'm not sure. I mean, that's something we could debate until the cows come up. Is it photography? It's certainly a photographic work. Um, and it's kind of a, there's a surrealist element here, isn't it? I mean, it does go back to Duchamp, I guess. But I often wonder what Robert Frank thought of it. Did he ever even see it? And what, what would he, he probably would like it, I don't know. Um, this is, I just preformed it here. This is a book, this is like one of the great things about my job is that, you know, you can get overwhelmed by books. And, then something would come up to you and just hand you something and blow you away. Just, and I was in New York um, at, a, at a dinner party and this one called me and said, I've, I've just started this publishing house called The Big Man. And this one of the books we're probably got, it's, it's a, guy, a guy who went to China and he found out that they had a pagan festival in China that was five, six hundred, seven hundred years old. It had survived the Cultural Revolution, my everything. And every year they had this best of when they dressed up and paid homage to the gods in China, in communist China. And he'd take, he, he only had a little Honda cheap camera, but I think, I think it's an amazing book. Um, this is a, sorry, this is, it's kind of gone, but that shouldn't be in there. But it, it, he basically used the Honda. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of you know, this kind of, the hipster thing of the cheap camera, and let's go out and buy a plastic camera and do it. But this, I think it kind of works for this subject matter. Um, I, I, it just landed in my lap, you know, this strange little book. And, I think that's a good photo. And then I thought I'd better end with something like this, because this is the sort of stuff I guess handled. I started with Ed Shed, so I figured I'd better end with this is something I guess a couple of years ago. Again, self-referential photo books, photo books that are ref referring to the history of photography are a huge thing. And this is one of the funnier ones, you know. We had the gas stations in this case, which we for gas in um, Not only that, but this is just about to be published, which is, uh, again, Google, so it's sort of hold-ups, stick-ups. And, you know, and I'm not quite sure of the worth of things it is. Um, I, I feel like this is kind of where we're at, and it's brilliant, but it's all so slightly depressing. Um, and it's to do with the fact that we all think we're editors, we all think we're photographers, we all think we're creators. And we all think that everything is free, and the whole imagery out there is all belongs to everyone. And we can do what we want with it. <coughs> and there's something quite interesting about the fact that, you know, this guy spent the time to go and travel through Google and find Baron Cold Ups in America. Well, I'm not sure it's the same energy that drove Ed Shea to make his very formal craft of portraits. And um, so I, I, I'm slightly conflicted about this world we're living in, which is one where things are getting more photographic and less about the art and craft of photography. Things are getting more referential, constantly referring back. But I think that's culture generally. I think that's sort of late capitalism generally. That's what it, that's happening in pop music, that's happening in films, it's happening in movies. It's as, as if we've run out of new ideas, so we've got to go back and rerun some of the older ones. And then, um, and the third thing that's happening is that the photo book is moving ever more into the centre of things, I think, for, for younger photographers and younger artists. And it's becoming more an art, like the artist book that we share. I mean, it's becoming this book that Artists who make photography make, 
rather than work with photography. So most of the work that I'd see at colleges or on MA shows, it's kind of coming from fine art and conceptual, even though it's photography. It's really coming from those traditions. It's not coming from Claudia Besson and that great tradition. It's coming from somewhere else, for better or worse. Um, but the hopeful thing is that the photo book is surviving, as, as you said yourself earlier, throughout the whole digital thing. It's still, it's still a beautiful thing that you want to come and have. And the, I think the uniqueness of it, I, I did an interview with um, Simon Baker, who's the, he's the first curator of photography at the Tate. 60 years after Sarkovsky, we finally found a get one in Britain. But um, one of the things he said, and we, we, were, we were talking about this, you know, that you can wander into an independent bookshop, like Don Mann's and East London, or the photographer's garden bookshop, and, or you can read someone and you can pick up your hand with a book, and you take the Chinese book, Shanghai, and you can take this home and go, like, this is such an amazing thing, and cherish it, and never think. I want to see the exhibition. I can't wait to see the show. You, because the book is the thing. The book is the object in itself. And I think that's really where we live now. It's, that's finally, and that was the case, of course, with the Americans, and with William Anderson's guy, and with Ansel Adams. But I think it's more the case now. And I think really the mainstream has a lot of catching up to do. Uh, and I, I noticed that when I'm writing in the, you know, in the Guardian, for instance. There's still, it's still rather I went and Review the man, I should have, you know, like if I come in with a brilliant new photo book, there's still an, a level of bafflement. And <coughs> I was quite interested in your idea that photo books should be in libraries. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that would work, given that there, there's a lot of them, but they're such limited editions, and you know, you've got to have gloves on them, and people take them home and take them back, they're going to steal them. What I think is that there should be repositories, like galleries or, or places like this, where you can go and look with the gloves on or look online. Even though I'm not quite sure about that, I haven't even touched on that one. Because more and more I'm getting sent PDFs of books. I did, I reviewed one last year and two weeks later the book arrived and I really felt like oh, I should have waited for the book. Because it wasn't the same. It really wasn't the same thing. And I, I was talking earlier on Martin about the, the um, Mitch Epstein book, the, Trees in New York, American Arbor or New York Arbor. It's a beautiful book. And uh, when I got the PDF, and the PDF was tiny, it just the book was such a beautiful thing compared to the mm. to the screen. So I'm not sure how you get. I mean, how how do you get people to see a book that was only 500 copies? And Martin Parr has 20 of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question I'm asking. Is that enough? Perfect. <laughs>
and you, you have a huge digital resource and teach. But I don't think I don't think colleges are cover. Colleges in Britain they teach they teach photography, and not that many of them anymore that teach pure photography. Mm -hmm. And some of them that do at Westminster or Royal College of Art are the really conceptual art courses about photography. I mean, they're, they're operating on a tradition, you know, Cindy Sherman and Jeff Wall. They're not operating in Claudia Bress on Robert Frank. You know, it's basically, that's, you know, that's an issue. And the role, we didn't even talk about the role of the curator, which is the other big thing in contemporary talk, which I've written about quite a lot. And the role of prizes. And the, 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 <laughs> and the, the complex nature of something like the Deutsche Boris Prize, which is the biggest most prestigious prize for contemporary photography, probably in Europe. Mm. And it's completely driven by curators and their agenda, which is conceptual photography. And people keep saying, oh, you've got to conceptual photography. I haven't. But what I don't like is the bias towards it, the curatorial bias, because it's where the money is. Mm. I mean, plain and simple, you know. You can still buy Robert Frank print for a reason. Try and buy Jeff Walker. It's kind of, there's a hierarchy. That's not to do with photo books. No, I don't think that, I don't, to answer your question, I don't think the educational thing in Britain, I think photography is beleaguered in a way, education. It's, again, it's not taken that seriously. Even though, like, somewhere like Westminster or the Royal College of Art produces quite amazing artists. You know, people who have done really well. Well, I think um, a lot of young people, I mean, I, I had this extraordinary thing last year where I went to Farnham, it's <coughs> quite a big uh, college, I'd say, but this in Sussex or something, it's kind of got people like Anna Fox teaching. So. Mm -hmm. Well, there was three of us doing the day thing, and the fact we had 15 students each. And I had 15 students, and two of them were using a camera on the photography course. <laughs> the rest of them weren't using cameras, we were, we were using fine stuff. And, uh, I thought, well, this is a real moment. I don't say that here. Uh, I, I think we have uh, about the same situation in, in uh, Gothenburg where they have a course for high uh, education photography, in, in photography. Uh, many, many of the students are using uh, yeah. other stuff. Well, you could teach it. You could teach the history of the photo book quite easily. Mm -hmm. I could be an academic coach. But, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think about uh, this uh, library. Is, uh, you have one thing, uh, those uh, traveling small exhibitions uh, uh, are, uh, that, that are showing photo books, yeah. uh, like for example yeah, this yeah. thing, um, and, and you have uh, one in Brighton. You have one in Brighton. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they are traveling yeah. around, uh, they have been filmed, I yeah. think they have been involved. Well, the design of the zone. What you're talking about, right? <coughs> what? Design of the zone, that's one I, I know that's like small, uh, perhaps, and, and, and yeah. That's just two guys who are enthusiasts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Yeah. But uh, Morgan Sheldon has just opened the museum in the castle. Yeah, yeah. Cullen. In Cullen. In Cologne. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is, you know, I don't know, have you seen it? I'll travel for two weeks this year. It opens on the 18th of August. Yeah, but yeah. I, I went to see the space in, um, when was it, in May, June, when I was part of that jury. And it was amazing how, what, what ideas he developed about the photo book, uh, not really just presenting a collection of photo <coughs> books, but what actually the impact of the photo book uh, was, and how he could also um, pull it into um, where it actually came from, like the, the like depending on the theme, of course, but on the everyday life. For example, they they um, rebuild the cafe limits um, um, <laughs> in a container um, <laughs> with a, like a little hole, so you could like peek in. Um, constructed according to the photo book. Yeah. And things like that. I'm so, really uh, thinking outside he, the box. He did that with the load on the left hand. Yeah. Some so. Um, and, and then uh, he told us also that he was. Um, uh, what's this, Chavez Heimer, um, this artist, a doctor from Cologne, um, who went around in the 70s to photograph at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning through the streets, and um, then made a photo book out of that, but also an exhibition um, at that time, and he 
kind of really an asset uh, that show in the photo of the museum. So, yeah, so pretty brilliant ideas of how you can um, mediate the photo book. Yeah. Also. Mm. I know Eric Kess is in Paris. Mm. He's a prankster in the Dutch guy. Do you know him? I don't know. He does. Um, <laughs> I'm a more artistic. He does really boring photography. <laughs> He's really interesting. Like, God, and he hates art photography. And he only likes photography that's functional. So his early magazine is really boring. Yeah. Yeah, the first one was all about you know, the photographs of food you see in kebab shops. Mm -hmm. There was awful photographs of all of yeah. Somebody obviously takes those photos. So you track down the guy who <laughs> and put out a book of his photographs of chicken kebabs. <laughs> and, um, he's famous for how not to photograph a black dog. Have you seen this book? It's the funniest photo book I've ever read. I should have shown it. Yeah, oh, the black dog, yes. He <laughs> found this album in a few months ago. It was his family had a black alsatian. Yeah. And they tried for 20 years to photograph it, but they always had it against the black background. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the family sitting around these two eyes. <laughs> and right, the very last photograph, they overexpose it and the dog comes out, but it's, yeah. it's white. Yeah. It's a big selling book. And this... It's a girl who was very interested in the shooting of oh, the really fairs. Right. And, and uh, every year she went to a fair in somewhere in Holland, I think. Yeah. And, and uh, she, someone took a photo of her. Uh, no, they, no, you had the bullseye, they took a photo of her. Oh, yes. Of the yeah. shooting girl. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. You know so, that so she went to the same place uh, all her life. She went every year with the carnival came to town you know, oh. to, to shoot. And if you hit the center, it mm. took a pull right oh, out. Yeah. And she kept them, so she had them for a Sixty years, mm -hmm. yeah. except for four years from the war, it was not. <laughs> but that's an amazing book. Yes, really, really good for What's that called? Well, the, the series is called One of the Living Picture. Yeah. I think she's volume seven, and it's, it, because it shows, I mean, she's obviously quite fanatic. But if, you know, the clothes change, the fashions change, yeah. the things behind it. It's, it's a real social history of the place, yes. and she's become a big star. <laughs> she sold her. Uh, she, 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 <laughs> MoMA bought her. So they're going to show them. Uh, I love this area. Can, can I tell you about one more? <laughs> because there is one in this area. Uh, there are two sisters. Uh, and I don't think Kessel know what whatever happened to those uh, sisters. But uh, in the first pictures, uh, you see them as small girls and they're growing bigger and bigger. Uh, and they're always standing uh, yeah. like this. And, and, uh, and suddenly the one sister is gone, but the photographer makes uh, space for her. So, so the picture is like this, and you have space for the sister. She isn't there. <laughs> she but has she died? Has no she one knows yeah. what happened because it's found pictures on, from the family. He's a genius. She should go and have a look at this. Mm. He's famous. He was an advertising guy. Yeah. He, had, he, he did this advertising campaign yes, for the, 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 worst, the most crap hotel in the world. Mm -hmm. It was a hotel in Amsterdam that was voted on TripAdvisor as the worst <laughs> hotel in the world. So he did this whole advertising campaign, come, come to this hotel, it's crap. <laughs> and he showed all the things like the damp and the horrible. <laughs> and he, he's a really interesting guy. And the last one that he did, I just want more because it's quite funny. The photograph of, of the guy who takes his wife in the water. Yes, yes. <laughs> he takes his wife fully clothed, submerged in water. Wherever they go, to Venice, she's in the canal. If they go to Amsterdam, she's in the If she can go to she's in the Thames. All of them get the clothes on. And he just takes a photograph after photograph. And he sent it to Kessel, so she put it out. Of you should invite him. He's the funniest guy I've ever heard talking about photography. And he hates anything I mean, he hates after photography. That, that is actually a, a, a short film about him. Yeah, uh, I have seen it on Swedish television, uh, and, and uh, it's quite interesting. Mm. You can see his 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 uh, his kind of uh, I had a road, uh, some uh, storage 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 with so many boxes with with found pictures. It, it's uh, enormous. <laughs> yeah. so, I think people are becoming fetishized. You know, because, of, because of what you're saying about the digital, mm -hmm. people want the real, they want the yeah, correct no. thing, they want the object. Mm -hmm. yeah. This that statistic about the opinion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are all over? No, no, no. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, uh, uh, taking, actually taking. Well, there's, there's a centre, eight, eight times at the New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Yeah. On Facebook alone, and it's six to the week. Yeah, I'm also saying that it's more. Yeah, but he says it's a young Okay, the average. Yeah. I don't think it matters as much as you think. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't worry about the same stuff. I keep telling the artists not to worry about Because I don't want to take a photograph, but it doesn't make you a photographer. But uh, no. wasn't it Kessel that in our was making a room with all the pictures yeah. across the yeah. top of it? And was a room like this? It's really like small. It's full of the 8x10. But I, I'm not if Tom was really worried about this. Now I get people coming on our camera. Everyone's taking photographs now. No. Like in the 60s, in, in 1967, over 60% of every household in America had an instant camera or a Polaroid. It, it, like, everyone. And, you know, the Anna Arbus and Robert Frank weren't going around going, oh, it's all over, everyone's taking photographs. I would think it's just a distraction. <laughs>
pages that I cannot adapt to the digital media. If I'm not very precise in what to photograph, then I can use the digital camera. If the image is already made in my head, I can use it. But in a, as an investigation of something, I cannot use it. That's probably generation. If you do yeah. all with that, you can. <laughs> It's very different, I mean, when you can't see the, your picture for like maybe 24 hours or even more, because you have to develop the film and then you go into the dark room, and it's a whole different process. But so it's, so it's two different you, things. When you interviewed Griffith, I you said, did you know that you've got an illness in your and you've got to put that, and you've got to be the one, even before this. It's interesting, they just know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, different focus. Yeah. But the vocabulary around photography is changing a lot. And that is, I think, because it's so many pictures. Yeah. Yeah, you can look at it. I mean, it's the only medium that's keeping up. You can look at that as well. It's the only thing that's totally in line with the digital world. Yeah. Photography is the one thing that's mm -hmm. offered and it's in it. And it's, you know, everything else is kind of struggling to keep up. Yeah, it's still there, but it's not thought. But yeah, but that, yeah, but it's good also. And none of the younger people talk about this. <laughs> We're just much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love this, right? I think it's just well, that's a good thing. You have to, I mean, you have to just embrace it and move it. Yeah. Well, yeah, use it for what you can do. But it's made of things. If you already have the picture in your head, it doesn't matter what kind of media you do it on. Just go, because if you know it's going to be, you can take three, and you can see, oh, well, this is too bright, and this is too dark, and this is the middle one, okay, I take this one. Then you can finish the process there instead of kind of making it tiny, and it's different. It's just like, it's different. It's not. No, it's just different.